Good morning and welcome. With words from Reverend Marilyn Sewell, I extend an invitation. Come into this circle of love and justice. Come into this community where we can dream and believe in those dreams. Come into this holy space where we remember who we are and how we want to live. Come now and let us worship together. Welcome to online worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I am Amy Pop, and I serve you as your credentialed director of religious education. This is a congregation that encourages freedom of belief, nurtures spiritual growth, and answers the call to service in the wider world. This is a welcoming congregation, and we are always growing in how we prepare a space for people of all races, abilities, sexual and affectional orientations, class, and gender. You are invited to come as you are. In naming this circle and offering this welcome, we recognize our presence as stewards of the land on which the church building exists. This land was nurtured by another people, the Peoria Nations. This history is part of our circle too. This is the second worship created by the Reverend Jennifer Innes as part of our candidating process. After this worship, all are invited to the Zoom meeting for a short conversation with Reverend Jennifer. Our technical volunteers will then use the same Zoom room to help the members transition into the congregational meeting. And now, what's happening in our church? We will hold our congregational meeting today at noon via Zoom to vote on our ministerial candidate. We will resume the following meetings this coming week. Wednesday, Joys and Sorrows at 7 p.m. Thursday, Adult RE, Semiosis Discussion at 7 p.m. And Friday, Muffins and Coffee with the Ministers at 9.30 a.m. The plant exchange has been moved to Mother's Day, May 10th, in a little bit of a different way. Register now for Regional Assembly to be held virtually June 24th through 28th. For more information on any of these events, please see the UU news that was sent on May 1st. We finish our announcements with a special message from the annual campaign. Thank you to Mary Keister and family for creating today's video. Hi, we are the Keisters and we are here to talk to you today about our RE program. So we're going to share a little bit about what our favorite things are. My name is Penny and my favorite things are the parties. My name is Ben and my favorite part, my favorite thing is Sunday school. My favorite thing is toffee hour. And your name is? Judah. Judah. All right. Um, I wanted to take this moment to talk to you a little bit about the pledge campaign and how um, all of these things are possible through the pledge donations, the whole RE program. And it's from things from the parties, the Halloween party, deck the halls, and um, to things like just our curriculum for a wonderful RE program. All of these things are so very important. And I think they're important, number one, for the lifelong memories these kids are making. They will always remember the Halloween parties. They will always remember Sunday school classes. They will always remember those fun times with their friends. But I think what is most important is the environment that we are providing for these kids to grow in. These kids will learn to be compassionate and thoughtful adults. They will learn to make the world a little bit better. It will be a little bit kinder, a little bit more accepting. We would teach them to make a difference, and I think that that is truly important. So that is why we support our church family, and we ask that you do the same and send those pledges so that we can keep providing this wonderful experience to make our church a better place and the world a better place. Thank you. Please do it. <laughs> The Song of Community is a way to open worship with music that can be shared and learned by all ages. This version of Carolyn McDade's Spirit of Life 
is presented by the All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C. The virtual choir will sing in Spanish and then in English. And after the hymn, the Reverend Marcus Foliano will offer our opening words. Good morning. I am the Reverend Marcus Foliano, an aspirant for Unitarian Universalist Ministry, honored to be sponsored by this, my home congregation, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I bring you these words this morning from my home in Chicago, where I live as a seminarian attending Meadville Lombard Theological School. These words are the words of my dear friend, the Reverend Teresa Soto, they serve on our UUA's Journey Towards Wholeness Transformation Committee, and this year received a call to serve as Senior Minister of the First Unitarian Church of Oakland, California. This meditation, We Hold Hope Close, can be found in Reverend Soto's 2019 Skinner House book, Spilling the Light, Meditations on Hope and Resilience. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but that cannot dissuade us. We don't always know what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in the wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath the foundation of our values and ethics. We are the people who return to, the, to love like a North Star and to the truth that we are greater together than we are alone. Our hope does not live in some glimmer of an indistinct future. Rather, we know the way to the world of which we dream and by covenant and the movement forward of one right action and the next, we know that one day we will arrive.
at home. Thank you, Marcus. The chalice I share with you today is from my current ministry in the Unitarian Universalist Society of Geneva. The flaming chalice is a gift that crosses time and space and all the stars. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, the fire of justice, and the fire of faith. It is the fire of love, of love burning deep in the human heart, that divine glow in every life. The special music for this morning is a newer hymn created from the Reverend Rebecca Parker's words and set to music by Elizabeth Norton. The hymn won the Association for Universalist Music Ministries Award for their hymn competition in 2014. It was presented at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Diego. The story for today is Honi and the Carob Tree. It's a Talmudic tale in Jewish tradition told by Penina Shram. Now Honi, the wise one, was also known as Honi the Circle Maker. By drawing a circle and stepping inside of it, he would recite special prayers for rain and was even known to get into an argument with God during a drought. Something about that worked, and the rains would come. He was, indeed, a miracle maker. As wise as he was, Honey sometimes saw something that puzzled him, and then he would ask questions in order to unravel the mystery. So one day, Honey, the circle maker, was walking on the road and saw a person planting carob trees. Honey asked the person, how long will it take for the tree to bear fruit? 
And the person replied, in 70 years. Honey was a little taken aback and asked them, do you think you will live another 70 years and eat of the fruit of this tree? And the person answered, perhaps not. However, when I was born, when I was born into this world, I found that many carob trees were there and planted by my mother and my grandfather. Just as they planted trees for me, I am planting trees for my children and my grandchildren, that they may be able to fruit, eat the fruit of these trees. I wonder what it means to be a planter of trees. I wonder who might be such a planter. I wonder if such planting as a beginning or an end. Here ends the story. In the circle of care created by this gathering, so many members, friends, and neighbors, we offer the joys and sorrows in our lives. These are the joys that express the abundance of our human experience. And these are the sorrows that are made easier to bear if they are shared and help people help carry the weight. I want to thank Shar Ricky for offering the messages today. We send our love and support to Barbara and Bob Ryan, who, uh, as Bob receives care at OSF St. Francis in their ICU. We also offer our love and support to all who are ill or who have family members who are ill. We appreciate how much in this time and in this place that so much lives in our hearts, far more than we can possibly offer in any one moment. Let us take one extra moment in quiet and in a pause for all the joys and sorrows that live in our hearts and are unspoken. For the meditation today, I offer a piece from the Reverend Kim Beach. Giver of being and freedom, thou who touches our lives in unforeseen ways, who unsettles our ease and upsets our self-satisfactions. We await in these moments of stillness and let the hidden processes of healing and growth do their silent work to let the quiet work of reconciliation be renewed among us. Because we know that the ultimate sources and issues of life, healing and growth, reconciliation and renewal, cannot be forced, either by excess of activity or by too many words. We seek out this stillness. We seek the quiet, this resting place of our restless hearts. Because we live with mystery, we trust that which is deeper than we know, which touches our hearts, which steadies us and rekindles our spirits, and which finally, in faith, may finally be named the love that has laid upon us, laid hold upon us, and indeed will not let us go. Let us welcome this love into our lives. Amen. We enter into a moment of silence. Let us take this moment as a gift that it is. It is a chance to share something together, no matter how far apart we may be. Let us cherish this time and this place and not let yet another moment simply pass by in the rush of our lives. Let us take one more moment in quiet.
Please join us for this morning's offering. Reverend Heather Christensen reminds us that Unitarian Universalism is a grand vision, a vision of a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. That vision is embodied in a few large congregations, numerous mid-sized congregations, and many, many small congregations. No matter its size, every congregation depends on each of its members. Each one of you, by your commitment of time, energy, and resources, helps make that grand vision real. Individually and together, we are Unitarian Universalists, building a world filled with peace and justice, love, and joy. Options for donations include sending a check to the church, making an online pledge by going to the website and clicking the donate button, or texting by calling 833-484-0328, waiting for the prompt and following the instructions. Thank you for your generous financial gifts, and thank you for all that is freely given for the care of this religious community and for the circle of care we extend into the world. I begin with a sermon with a song from the duo Ma Muse. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round attend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change and lie from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive, it is time to lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. Having spent the past couple of weeks asking nearly every group about how individuals and the congregation are handling all these transitions in ministry, it seems fair that I would offer a minister's perspective. Now, these past couple of weeks have been as important for me in some ways as for you because I am in my own transition. I am letting go of my previous ministry in Geneva and moving closer to Peoria. And I can tell I am mid-shift uh, because my pronouns are a mess. I can't tell when I should say you or when I should say this congregation or we or us and all, doing that all before today's vote. We're not even in the same physical space. There is a cognitive dissonance in using Geneva's chalice while preaching for Peoria. But here's the image that came to me as I was driving around Sunday afternoon after hosting the Zoom coffee hour in the sanctuary. So I feel like I feel like um, a heart, a, a person-sized heart, if you will, that is poised between two ocean liners going in different directions. Now, one ship is headed this way and the other is headed that. And there I am in the process of letting go from one while preparing to leap fully into the other. Now, the change was always in the plan, mind you, the interim minister leaves the congregation and embraces the next ministry. And doing so requires 
navigating so many moving parts and multiples of everything happening at the same time. So here we are on the brink of an enormous leap of faith and a major undertaking to figure out what ministry together might mean for the present and for tomorrow. We are working from the momentum of those who came before in this congregation's 177, as of Tuesday, year history, along with those who are here now. For the next chapter in this community's life, you are preparing to receive new companions and new perspectives. Every time somebody enters the congregation, something is a little bit different. And we do all of this amid the context of shifting roles of the role of institutional religion in individual and social life. We are in the middle of profound alterations in how church is understood. And we're also figuring out what it means to be the church when we're not in the building. We get to articulate and live into its larger mission and purpose. We get to figure out what it is to be a liberal religion, uh, this servant church, this pilgrim church, and embrace this adventure of the spirit. Now, I will offer that our starting point for navigating all the moving parts is our theological resilience. 20th century Unitarian Universalist theologian James Luther Adams tells us that in liberal religion, Revelation is continuous. We are open to new truth and are open to finding truth in a multitude of sources and forms. We are witnesses to how faith and belief and ritual, along with nature and the cosmos, as well as human actions, all show up in life and in history. And through the lenses of thought, intuition, experience, tradition, education, we determine how to place ourselves in relationship with the world, even as we keep wondering and building and revising and refreshing. So what we learn and what we cherish also has to include a direct application. So our theological openness must have real life impact if it's to have gravity and meaning. Adams reminds us that there is no immaculate conception of virtue. I'll say it again. There is no immaculate conception of virtue. If you preach it, you have to live it. And so let me offer for a moment why I talk about him. I've made a couple of those points before, but this is really why I talk about Adams in particular. I'll go deeper into them, but for now, let me offer that Adams he visited Europe uh, in the 1930s and witnessed the failure of the church to declare a moral center and resist the rise of the Nazis. The church did not use its power to act against the growing force of destruction. Plain and simple. Adams came away from that moment determined to figure out what the liberal church can do and to claim its authority and power in the moment and named its possibility and its responsibility in liberal religion. The liberal church in every age must respond to the systems of oppression if those values are to be relevant and to indeed have impact in the world to nurture what we plant and what we hope for. As Quaker guide Parker Palmer tells us, let your life speak. We can debate theology and theory and politics and books and everything and so much more. And then what do we do about it? Christian religious educator Maria Harris tells us that the congregation is the curriculum we are our own lessons in the day-to-day -day and ongoing conduct of congregational life. How we engage 
what we avoid, how we say yes or no, are all information for visitors and members and friends and for our children. How we interact with each other, who we include, and how we declare limits around behavior are all expressions of what we preach. In the examined faith, we are thoughtful and intentional as much as possible, as long as long, also while being joyful and honest and compassionate. So, in case it wasn't clear, I have some high expectations, both of you and of me. And what has been wonderful to experience in the past couple of weeks is that you do too. I expect a liberal church to show up, not in a one-time only kind of uh, way, or not in a way that uh, I expect the congregation, any single congregation, to save the world, as it were. But there is so much ahead of us, right in front of us, in fact, with all the projects and the concerns of this congregation and of the city. I take a cue from Stan Lee and Spider-Man that with great power comes great responsibility. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a unique obligation to participate in the way that a religious community can and does and still and now more than ever needs to do so. The form of how to do church is really fluid at this time it's going to be hard to know exactly how to predict what we will be like in 10, 20 years. But we also get to do this work together and have a larger perspective of what we are apart. It is sacred work that we do, something that is set aside because doing this is a special application and a particular way to care for the world and all of our ages and all of our children beyond the congregation, or even a particular faith, we are part of something that is so much greater than ourselves. And the work has already been with us in these past couple of weeks. Uh, for me, even meeting by Zoom, uh, the meetings and the conversations have been really beautiful. Together we are solving problems along with revealing hopes and dreams, I get to listen to stories about what this congregation means to you and the joy and great spirit of being with this body and with these people. Now, before I go any further, let me not uh, downplay the challenges as well. Creating religious community in the best of times is messy and awkward and perpetually unfinished and terribly unresolved. You and I both will be uncomfortable and ticked off and frustrated and even at times wonder if all this is worth the trouble. Seriously, I, I will make mistakes and I will disappoint you and I will feel the same about you. We will need a lot of forgiveness and a lot of grace and offering that to each other as often as possible. I'll tell you that the goal that we have in committing to new ministry together is not, is not to be perfect or to make each other happy. This is something we talk about with couples who want to marry, that happiness, one's own happiness, is not your partner's job. It's never your partner's job. They are not there to make you happy, and you're not there to make them happy either. Those are not the promises you are making. The promise that comes from entering into a sacred relationship is that of more abundance, of a more abundant life together. To be in that kind of commitment amplifies the experience of everything we do. 
And this applies to church and ministry as well. We do this ministry together because we cannot do it alone. And, and the promises are still not to make each other happy, but to be more joyful, to live into hope and possibility. Our effort yields a far greater result than anything we could accomplish alone or even as a family or even as a group of friends. Reverend Mark Morrison Reed reminds us that our perspective becomes wider in the religious community and we come, become more open to, to new truth and new revelation as well. We are part of a love that will not let us go. And we commit to remaining in that promise and in that relationship for as long as we are able. Now, the forms of this ministry, because we have to have direct application, right? The forms this ministry takes, the forms this abundant life shows up as, there's so much that's already here, so much that has been passed down along the ages and the years to this moment. There is already worship. There is already small groups working together. I'll tell you what I shared with the facilitators the other day. Um, the way I learned, first learned about small group ministry was the phrase, saving the world 10 people at a time. You wonder where I get my high expectations. No small expectations there. But 10 people at a time, a little here and a little there, that feels manageable. That feels like we could actually make a difference. But we also get to do this in connecting with other congregations in this ministry, in our social witness, in naming oppression, in calling the truth as we see it. We are learning from the curriculum of our lives across the country. We remain committed to investing in preparing a place for those who find this place in the next generation. All of this we do together in that balancing between going from one place to the next. So much is before us. This next ministry begins with willing to commit to a new future and to lead with love. We shall indeed be known by the company we keep. May we begin by keeping this company with each other. Amen. And I invite you to enjoy our closing hymn. I know this rose will open, yet another way that we can express both all the fullness of our heart, some of our concerns, and some of our hopes. And let's do this in singing. I know this rose will open, I know my fear will burn away, I know my soul will unfurl its wings, I know this rose will open, I know, 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 I
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. With faith in the creative powers of life, with hope for the future of life in our world, with love for all who share life with us, let us go forward together in peace. Our worship is ended. May our service begin. And immediately following the service, before the congregational meeting, your leaders and I invite members and friends to join a Zoom meeting that will start with a question and answer time with me. And at noon, in the same Zoom room, the congregational meeting will begin. And for the sake of being able to track the votes, the congregational meeting will be members only. And as the courageous and determined technical team manages the work of bringing people into the meeting, please be patient. They are asking for names and checking against the member list in order to tally both the quorum and the total participation of members in that meeting. Also, if you are a member, please do your best to stay for the entire meeting, including through the process of taking the count on the question of whether to call me as your next minister. Your presence and your vote matter. And now let me end with one more bit of song. Amen, 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 amen. Sing it loud now. Amen. Everybody say, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Everybody say, Blessed be, blessed be. Blessed be, 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 blessed be. Let us go forth. <laughs>